Hey, man, and you be saying good morning. It's great to see you today. Uh, boy, that song is a perfect way to kick off this morning service. Um, this has been a very interesting week for a lot of reasons, and let me just share two of them with you, and then we'll get to our announcements. Um, Friday afternoon late, there was a family that stopped in. A husband, two college-aged daughters, one from Humboldt, one from UCLA, parents, and a mother-in-law. And they stopped in because their daughter, daughter-in-law, wife, and mom, all one person, is under hospice care, about 49 years old. Never met this family. Somebody gave them our name, and they stopped by here to look at the sanctuary and to ask questions, trying to be prepared for when there would be a need for a service. So we spent about an hour and a half sitting right here on the front row. Mark met him first, and uh, we had a little handoff, and, and uh, we spent some time with him. And uh, they thought by hospice uh, suggestions that they probably had five days to a week. She passed away in the middle of the night, Friday night. And a, former, a current school teacher in Clovis Unified at Mountain View, um, Roger Skinner's wife, uh, and I have to be honest, I don't even know her first name yet. I know her as Mrs. Skinner. So um, I want you to be praying for this family that, that God's grace is sufficient for them. And that however God may use various ones of us in new hope, that that sufficiency of God's grace at a time like this will be very evident to them. So I'd appreciate you praying for them. Then last night, just uh, about 15 minutes before I was scheduled to go pick up the Cousinos to take them to um, a kind of a fundraising event last night out in the country towards Kerman, big town of Biola. It's where Lindsay's mom lives, and as you know, Lindsay's been our pioneer for 1040i. And so for some of the folks out in that part of the community that have helped uh, with Lindsay and the project she's been engaged with, along with New Hope, uh, we were out there. But I got this phone call. Actually, it was, again, Mark came by the church, uh, found a message that had been left, um, and it was for Stanley Keene. Some of you may know Stanley. He's a long, long-time Clovis resident. He served on the... Um, he has served on the rodeo board for multiple decades, probably over 30 years. Um, I've known Stanley for at least 25 years. He's been to a lot of memorial services here. And the last one he attended, right by that door, as he walked out, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, uh, Tim, I want you to know I got things right with Jesus today. And that was wonderful to hear. That was several months ago. Uh, and I told Stanley on another occasion that whenever I matured, I hoped I was as good-looking as he was. Uh, Stanley Keen was a, a good-looking retired gentleman, let me tell you. He was tall, broad at the shoulders, narrow at the hips, nothing much around the midsection, and uh, was one of the gentlest, kindest men that I think I've ever met. And um, I had a call. The call was from his daughter, and so returned the call, and come to find out, Stanley wanted to be baptized. And that was exciting to hear, but what we didn't know is that Stanley was sick. He had cancer, been fighting it for a few months now, and he had just gone under hospice care. And um, the daughter told me, she said, uh, my mom was reading some notes that he's been writing over the past uh, couple of months about wishes and desires. And she said, my mom just read a few minutes ago, I want to be baptized, call Pastor Tim. And so when they called, I, getting ready to go to another event, and I said, here's the, here's the deal. I can come right now or I can come after night. Because after I talked with them for a few moments, I knew this was going to be very, very close. And, uh, and they said, come right now. What I didn't realize is how close Stanley lived to us. He was four minutes away from our house. Uh, lives on Timmy, by the way. Um, and so uh, got to their house, about 12 members of his family there, his grown kids, their spouses, uh, sibling and, and, and his spouse, and uh, walked into his bedroom, and, and Stanley does not look like Stanley. Uh, his body has wasted away with the cancer. They said, Tim, he's not been responsive for the last six hours. Uh, my mom wants to do this simply to grant his wish. And I said, you know, he may be more aware than you think. You just got to talk loud enough. And uh, so I got on the bedside next to Stanley, and I told him who I was and what I was here to do, and his head snapped over, looked right at me, 
opened up big eyes and he reached his hand up and grabbed my hand. And uh, I said, are you ready for this? And he nodded his head. And so uh, they brought me and they said, how are we going to do this? I said, I need you to bring me a bowl of water. And I told him the story that I'm a Baptist and we usually dunk people all the way under the water. But in his current situation, um, I said, I had to call a Presbyterian pastor to teach me how to do this many years ago. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I said, we'll get it done. And uh, you should have seen the smile that lit up his face at that moment. And uh, I checked with the daughter this morning. His breathing is much more shallow. Um, again, it'll be a surprise if he makes it through the day, but I want you to pray for the Keene family. God's grace is sufficient for them as they go through this process. So uh, thank you for being the kind of church that allows us to be available to help families that come in right off the street that we've never met before and those that we've had the opportunity to encounter. Uh, thank you for being here. If you were a guest today, there are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by later. And we promise not to beat on your door or pester you on the phone, but through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about our church family and what goes on around here. Uh, but let me direct your attention towards the screen as we see our morning announcements. New Hope Church is very excited to introduce to our church family, Cecil Spurlock. He has been a member here for, uh, shoot, how long, Cecil? 15 years? 15, 16, 15, 16 years. And Cecil is gonna be coming on staff here at New Hope. He's going to be our care director and visitation pastor. His primary responsibilities are going to be staying connected with the seniors of our congregation, visiting people in the hospital before surgery, and when people are no longer able to get out to services, Cecil is going to be our contact with those individuals and their families. So Cecil, welcome to the staff Thank at New Hope Community best. Church. Two days from today is going to be our senior luncheon for September. Falls on the 11th this year, and we have some good news for you. You don't have to prepare any food for this luncheon. It's being provided for you by Luna's. Just bring your $5 and you'll drop it in a basket as you go through the line, and you are good for the luncheon this week. If you can't afford the five bucks, don't worry about it. Come anyway, we'd love to have you join us. We're gonna be doing something very special. We're going to be playing a not so newlywed game for couples who have been married more than 50 years. And you're going to enjoy this wonderful opportunity to see how well they know each other after multiple decades of marriage. Let me give you a sample of what it's like. Wow, I've got a choice of about six or seven different. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's see, prop, just one of them. Probably leaving my clothes on the floor by the side of the bed. No. Oh no. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's yeah. On Tuesday nights, we're doing a men's Bible study from 7 to 8 p.m. in the office. This time we're doing Revelation. So if you want to come and join us for some great conversation and to learn more about this interesting but often confusing book, then 7 p.m. Tuesday nights, men's Bible study. Family nights are starting again. Wednesday, September the 12th, there'll be adult and kids Bible studies. The kids this session are going to spend seven weeks learning about the life of Jacob through various slime experience. So we're gonna make lots of slime. That's for our preschool through fourth grade students. And of course, our fifth and sixth graders are still meeting every week as well. If you're a parent and you're dropping off a kid for the kids' studies, or you're just an adult that wants to go to a Wednesday night adult Bible study, then I'll be doing Forgotten God by Francis Chan. It's a chance to talk about the Holy Spirit and find out how we can re-engage with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that goes from 7 to 8, the same time as the kids' sessions. We also have dinner at 6.15 for anyone that wants to come that's going to these Bible studies. Hi, I'm Nan Isom. I teach the Tuesday night women's Bible study, and we start again on September the 11th. This time we are going to be doing the book of Ecclesiastes. We meet from 6.45 to 8 o'clock each and every Tuesday. So if you'd like to join us, you're welcome to do so. If you're interested in doing Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University, the nine-week class starts on September the 16th. It's at three o'clock on Sunday afternoons, and there's a sign-up sheet going around today. Good morning, I'm Tina Brown and I lead the Wednesday morning Bible study. Currently we're in the book of Galatians and then come December we're going to dive into the book of Philippians. We start every Wednesday at 9.30 and we are done by 11. Feel free to join our group any week and we'd be happy to see you. 
Hey guys, it's PFC Robinson. I just got all your letters. I'm about to go pass them out. I just want to say thank you and we appreciate all your support. To get more information on these and other upcoming events, visit newhopechurch.net. Oh, all right. So uh, put all those important dates down so you don't forget them, and we hope to see you there. Uh, I noticed something watching that video on the 8 o'clock service. Men's Bible studies are 45 minutes to an hour. The ladies' Bible study are an hour and a half. I'm not sure what that says to us. I have some thoughts, but I'll keep them to myself. All right? You're praying for the man. It takes up a lot of your time. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's very good. That's very good. That was better than the thought I had. So that's good. <laughs> Let me uh, highlight just a couple of other prayer requests. Uh, first off, uh, thanks from the Levendusky family for all the support that uh, many of you have been. We had Mary Ann's memorial service yesterday. It was a packed house, some additional chairs uh, set up, and it was uh, about as joy-filled as a service can be. Uh, from, from the sharing about her life to family members sharing uh, about their memories, it was really a service filled with joy. And uh, Mary Ann's husband gave me permission to share the story of his journey to faith, of how he invited Christ in his life a week before she passed away in her hospital room. He's rather shy about, he doesn't like, he sat up here and he kept his head down the entire service except for when the pictorial tribute was up and he stared and looked at his wife. But apart from that, he sat here, he's a big man. Uh, but yet he boldly invited Christ in his life in her hospital room, and he gave us permission to share that story, and that made it an exceedingly happy occasion. Uh, Ray Steele from our church, part of our church board, as you know, he's been battling a brain tumor for a couple of years now. Ray has outlived anybody really I've ever known with a glioblastoma brain tumor. Uh, he's done amazingly well with it, and um, he was in the hospital this week, had nothing to do with that. He was in the hospital because somehow he got salmonella. And so uh, he was in the hospital for four and a half days. He did get to go home late yesterday afternoon. We're grateful for that. Continue to remember uh, him and his recovery in your prayers. Helen Heath had a surgical procedure at Kaiser on Friday, and I got word from Cecil. He's been on the job already this week, and uh, that she is home and expecting to be maybe in our last service this morning. So we're grateful for that. So just a couple of uh, updates that we wanted to share with you. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning uh, tithes and offering. And would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, I love you. I'm so grateful for who you are and all that you have provided for us. Father, the scripture says this is the day that you have made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. And I hope that's the attitude of every one of us as we arrived here today. If that was not the case, I hope by the time we leave here, we have allowed your grace to minister to our hearts, change our attitude so we recognize your handiwork and giving us life for this day and then giving us your very presence in us to get through the challenges of the day. Father, we lift up um, so many families to you this morning, from the Skinner family to the Steele family to the Stanley Keene family to the Leffendusky family, to others, Father, who are recovering from surgeries and for others who are awaiting their next step. Uh, Father, we trust you with the needs for Shelley. Found out this past week She's going to be scheduled for some arthroscopic surgery in the next few weeks, and we just commit those needs to you. Father, for Mike and Deline Cousineau being with us today from 1040i, um, but Father, for me, it's more than just the fact that they are the leaders of 1040i. It's the fact that they are very dear friends, and we are grateful for the relationship that uh, you have fostered between us over the decades and it's exciting to have them in service with us today. Lord, you know what each of our needs are, and though this is a different kind of service than most Sundays, thank you for what you have in store for us as we learn about your handiwork in other parts of the world, and we also discover how we can be engaged with your handiwork in the far-fung places of your creation. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thanks. 
We commit this and so much more to you in the incredible name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Sign up sheets going around. Uh, Man Camp is on here. If you've already signed up, you don't need to. Financial Peace. And let's see here. Senior Luncheon, all right, is on here. If you're going to be attending this Tuesday, we want to make sure we have enough food. So make sure you sign up. I think they've got 70 some odd. 67 signed up for Senior Luncheon already. So please sign up. There is a passage of Scripture. It's found in the uh, very last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It's, uh, it's probably one of the more uh, well-known, memorized passages of Scripture, somewhere after John 3.16. In verse 16 of chapter 28, it reads like this. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee. How many disciples did Jesus call? Twelve. How come he says eleven? Somebody say Judas? Yeah, uh, Judas is dead. The night of his betrayal, he couldn't stand... He couldn't stand the emotional torment of the bad decision that he made, and he attempted to hang himself, and he failed at that. And he fell to the ground far below him and was killed. So there's 11 left. This is after the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. It's, it's one of his last messages to his disciples. Not the last one, but probably second to last. And this is what he said to them. All authority. How much? Anything left out? No. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So this comes in a pretty powerful way, doesn't it? There's no reservation in this directive. All authority is behind me when I tell you this. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the same formula that Jesus gave then that we used last night at Stanley Keene's bedside. And teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely, without a doubt, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Those 11 disciples, according to the historians of their culture, literally turned the world upside down. It wasn't because every one of those 11 disciples went to every part of the world. But every one of those disciples was sent to a different part of the world. You go read their history, you will find they went to different parts of the world. And they shared the gospel and they planted churches and it transformed the known world and it's still transforming our world today. The authority that was given to those 11 2,000 years ago is the same authority that still sends the church today to the uttermost parts of the world. That doesn't mean that every one of us in here are going to go all the way to the other side of the globe. For some of us, it's to go down the street. For others, it's to go down the hall in your own home. But for all of us who are part of the church, if we can't be those who go, we are to be a part of those who send. You see, most can't go unless there's somebody helping to send them. It takes the prayerful support, and it takes the financial support, and it takes the emotional support in order for this great commission to be fulfilled. It's one of the reasons that we have a family from our own church who serves in Uganda, Africa, fulfilling this commission, and we help that be accomplished. It is the reason for the last 10 plus years we have been engaged with Mike and Deline Cousineau and 1040i is to help us go and fulfill this commission Sometimes I hear, but pastor, we have so many problems right here in Fresno. Yes, we do. And do you know we have somewhere like 1,800 churches right here in Fresno County to help address the needs of Fresno County. They don't have that in other parts of the world. 
And it's part of the responsibility of this community and of this church family to not only go to the needs of Fresno County like we do with Heinz Hospice and Fresno Rescue Mission and Safe Families, but it's also part of our privilege and responsibility to take this message around the world. We have about 30 people out of our congregation who over the last 10 years have made the trip to Ivory Coast, Africa. It started with one. I wished I could say I was the first. But it took a woman from our church to lead the way. Lindsay Eccles is the first one. She is probably the last person I would have said would be the first one to go to Ivory Coast, Africa. And she has now made the trip five times. And she put on a fundraiser last night. I just got word uh, just under $9,000 was raised out of 60-some people last night at a special event out in Biola. And uh, we're very, very grateful for that. But you and I have a responsibility to be engaged in this great commission. Uh, we had eight go last year. That's our second largest group. The previous year we had 10. That's the largest we've ever had go. And so uh, we've got a short video clip, all right, uh, from our team last year. We do have a video clip. That's the water tower at the Duropo area. That's the night before we left San Francisco to get on a plane to go. One of the surgeons and Steve in the background. Street vendors as the bus stops in one of the villages. Todd to school, you'll hear more about that in their student body. Little Chris, our adopted child in Africa. They all like to have their picture made. Uh, that is the medical mash tent where surgeries are done. That is the recovery tent where they go to after surgery's been done. That's setting up a surgical room and that's the card I push patients on. That's the kitchen area by where we stay and eat. That's our laundry because it gets dirty. That's our hotel rooms in the background. Steve from our church, he's the brains. He does the inventory with computers so we know everything that is there in storage. The pharmacy. We're drug pushers. Bow bow trees. They're amazing, amazing landscape there. Uh, inside a classroom, a freshly painted chalkboard. Kids Fest. All those kids for four days. Some of them broken down into various classrooms, learning songs. We even gave them tattoos. Another one of the Kids Fest classrooms. Out for activities. I don't know if you can see the big figure in the back, a dinosaur, terrified those kids. They were ready for the last day chapel. Some of them gave their life. Look how white the preacher's legs are. <laughs> that was the last service, and some of those kids gave their life to Christ. Pastor Mark, there with one of our volunteers from the Ivory Coast. That is done morning and evening to take water to the village. It's a little harder than turning on a faucet in our homes preparing a meal. That's the library we built two years ago. 26 iPads inside there teaching them various uh, studies like science and math. Branded from our church, construction crew. They're building the canteen that we built last year so Madame Elise and 40 adopted children of hers can eat under a roof and not sit out on the dirt. Brandon with two of the local workers assisting him or he was assisting them, putting final touches on the canteen. There it is with the tables. You all purchased all of those tables, the construction on that building. That's repairing the roof from the dormitory we built three years ago that got blown off uh, in a tornado storm the previous year. The new roof from inside the room. Some of the kids just checking out what's going on. The bicycles, one of the dormitories, the first dormitory that we built. You can't have a canteen without silverware and dishes. 
There's Madame Elise and one of her workers there giving thanks to us, presenting to us a special wall hanging. Madame Elise flashing her smile. I hope she can come and visit us one day. That was our entire team with some of the local workers. Inside the library where you can see the books, the computer pads, iPads are set up. They're receiving some additional instruction. Can anybody know what that is? Cashew. Baptism. Baptized 12 that Sunday. Uh, anyway, you can pause that and back up. I want you to back up to the baptism. Okay, go forward to the baptism. <laughs> Cashew. Okay, that's how the water looks and worse right out of their well. Okay, so that's important for you to understand when you see the water filters later what happens. But that's what it is. That's also the reason that Mike, the first year I was there and they asked if I would come to a baptism, he said, Tim, you're not getting in the river or their ponds. Um, so he gave them a bathtub that was out somewhere and that bathtub has been used. They've been offered $200 for that bathtub. They're hard to come by in that part of the world and they won't sell it because we do baptisms every year on a Sunday afternoon there. All right, you can continue. Mark preaching. Brandon getting in with the surgeon. Tom, one of the work crew, maintenance guy for us from our church. One of the kids showing up for help. Tom and the two guys that trained him how to be a fix-it guy. I don't know who threw that picture in. Beauty in the midst of a harsh country. Candace, she was a student nurse last year. There's Lindsay taking care of people in post-op. Candace again on your left. Oh, I probably shouldn't have put that one in, Mike. I'll take that one out after today. That was one of those surgeries. You can see the foot orthopedic surgeon equivalent to our Dr. Hansen here. Candace lounging. Candace working. One of the kids who major, major orthopedic surgery on both legs. She had never done an IV before this trip. Going to church on Sunday morning. Brandon, two of the staff that was in post-op. Construction crew. Oh, that's the sweetest lady in the world right there between Candace and I. That's where we eat. Do you think he was going to fall on you? Serving. There's Lindsay with uh, Fidel who was with us last year. That's, the, that's a water filter right there. That water filter will take care of a million gallons of water. It goes in dirty, comes out crystal clear and clean. Distributed them in the village there that Lindsay took them to. Backpacks that uh, Lindsay's mother's church, our young people and others donated and packed and were delivered for the students in that village. Uh, we had eight who went last year, and I've been looking around. I think we only have one in the service, in this service. Most of them are 11 o'clock. I'm not sure what that says about this service. You're the senders. Uh, Mark, come on up real quick. He's the only one who went on last year's trip. Uh, anybody in this service who's been on one of the trips, would you please stand? I know we have a couple. Right here. All right, Fawn and Shelly have both been on trips. Thank you for going. All right, Mark, this last trip. Uh, was this trip meaningful to you and why? You've uh, been on another trip before, right? I've been on another trip. This was meaningful because the other trip I went on was a slightly different format. It wasn't the medical and construction. Uh, it was more of a discipling type trip for some younger men. 
so this was interesting. When I turned up, there was um, a completely different environment than I saw before. It was the medical and construction machine that is 1040. It comes in, sets up, and it's, it's extraordinary. There's people that just get everything done and get it set up quickly, and they're ready, ready for surgery. So uh, that was amazing for me to watch uh, and to see the medical side of it, which is uh, so vital for people there. But um, I did a lot of Kids Fest stuff, this sort of vacation Bible school in the villages, and uh, just working with the kids was, was amazing. They're, just, they're very smart, and they're very responsive, and they just love to learn, and they love to play, and they love to uh, learn about the Bible, and the translators are extraordinary. They do a great job. Um, so for me, that was really special, being able to interact with the kids and to be able to teach them about Jesus um, through a translator, which was, which was kind of awesome. The people there are just amazing. And maybe your favorite moment of the trip? I've, I had a few, but there was one in particular, and you saw a picture of it. I was preaching at a church in Doropo, and um, it was, you know, my sermon was only 20 minutes, but it took about almost an hour to deliver it because it was going from English to French to Lobi, and uh, there was a couple of hundred Africans and the American team there as well, and it was, uh, I don't know, for me it was amazing. It was just incredible experience to be able to preach like that in a church uh, in the middle of the Ivory Coast, so that was very special. Good. Terrific. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you sharing. Uh, come back tonight and hear some more at 5 o'clock this evening right here. Uh, some more of those who went last year will be able to be here and we'll show maybe a few more pictures and hear a little bit more of their stories and share with you how you could go on the trip this coming February. Uh, right now, I just know of two of us who are going, all right? It will be one of our smaller groups if a few more of you don't go. Uh, but we'd love to have you come back tonight, uh, 5 o'clock, probably be about an hour and 15 minute evening. And uh, we're not going to have any worship time tonight. We're going to just talk about Ivory Coast and this trip. So we hope you'll come and join us for that. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of answer for you uh, two questions. What or who is 1040i? If you have your bulletin, I want you to grab it, look at it, all right? Look at the front cover. I think I left mine out here. This front page tells you right here the what is 1040i. Uh, it's health, it's water, it's education. Look at all of the surgeries and surgeries and medical procedures and the, the areas of water and education. These are three key areas. Most of you who are here and you've been with us in the past, you, you know this. This is a faith based organization. It is a Christ-centered. It is at the heart of what Mike and Deline do. If you go to the 1040 website, though, you will not discover that. You will see it as a compassion organization that functions in the area of health, water, and education. And the reason for that is they go to more places than just Ivory Coast. There have been times in the history of the Ivory Coast where going in as a faith-based organization has been dangerous. We don't have time for Mike to tell that part of a story, but Mike has been captured, beaten, and he escaped with them shooting their weapons at him in the bush. Uh, I say that, and then some of you say, you think I'm going to go to Ivory Coast with you on a trip? That was many years ago, all right? It was many years ago, and he's here, okay? So... Uh, it's okay. But there have been times and there are places that uh, you cannot openly share your faith. They go to another country, which is, 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 is a Muslim country where Christianity is not welcomed at all. And they go in, in these other areas, at, at the invitation. They don't still do this on their own. They go in at the invitation of the underground church okay, in that nation. And they go in and help them in these areas, and that encourages the church, and it gives credibility to the church as they talk about what faith in Jesus Christ does and how we even, Christians, are willing to offer help to those who don't agree with them, who don't believe the same way they do. None of this work is conditional upon them listening to a message, accepting Jesus, going to a service, this is all done out of the love of Christ, whether they ever hear about that or not. But that's why when you go to the website, it'll be kind of sanitized. But you need to understand the what and the who really centers around Jesus Christ. These are the statistics. But the heart and soul of this man and this woman right here is what 1040i is all about. 
Let me give some of you a little, a, a little history. Mike, when is the first time you ever went to the Ivory Coast? Or Côte d'Ivoire? Say it the way it's supposed to be said. Côte d'Ivoire. Yeah. So this past July would be 49 years ago when I first set foot on the continent and the country. I was almost 15 years old. So that'll tell you that I'm just about as old as Tim. <laughs> We're almost twins. We're not very far apart. Um... When you were a teenager, did you ever want to go back to the Ivory Coast? You know, in the first service, I said it was 47 years ago that I told my mother while I was in the bush on vacation from school one day, I said, Mom, if I ever get out of Africa, I'll never come back. And, you know, God has, does have a sense of humor, whether we believe it or not. And I just think that God said to himself, really? Let me see what I can do about that. And I'm convinced that he went straight to work on my heart. I know he did because I'm still going. So you, uh, you left Ivory Coast for what purpose? After you graduated high school, what was your reasoning for coming to the States? My reason was to prepare to return. My father was an outstanding evangelist. He had such a love for the people. And I can remember many times him passing through our living room in the house that we lived in. This was way before television and, you know, all we had was one of those record players. And uh, we would play games. And he would come from his office and like he had just had an allergy attack and just had been crying before God for the souls of the African people. And I never forgot that. And I would go with him to numerous villages. And one of the things that I saw was the literacy rate was extremely low and the people couldn't read the scripture. So there was no one to teach them outside of my father going maybe once a week for an hour as he was trying to reach as many villages as he could. And so God spoke to me as a teenager and he showed me the need to one day return and train the Ivorians to pastor and to plant their own churches. So that was my number one goal when I returned back to the United States. I started school in Tennessee and eventually ended up in Oklahoma where God would send to me one of the most precious people on the planet, coming from the desert of West Texas, and that would be Deline. We've had quite a journey together. Yeah. Some of you have heard me tell this about Deline in the past, but she was one of my mama's favorite people on all the earth. She loved Deline with all of her heart and loved so much the ministry that she's done. And um, our love for Deline has grown over these last 10 years as we've gotten better acquainted and over these last few years as we have watched her continue to be God's woman, uh, keeping God's man doing what he needs to be doing. Uh, she battles Parkinson's. And uh, for the last three years, she has continued to go to the Ivory Coast, which is not an easy place when you face challenges like she does. And uh, it's amazing. And she is in her room sometimes during the day, and you can hear her pray. And she has cards with every person who's on the team's name on it. And throughout that week, she is pulling every one of us aside for just a word of encouragement. And uh, she is so vital and so incredible. And the dream that, that Mike had also became the lean stream. So when you went back to Ivory Coast Africa as missionaries, you went back and you started a college. We did. That was foremost on my heart. But you know, sometimes it takes a while. And when Delina and I first arrived on October the 31st, 1980, we were the youngest kids on the block. So we had all of these senior missionaries that had done it and 
you know. And so we were new, full of energy, and 13 days later, our daughter was born. Can but, you imagine that? Uh, you know, she was a trooper. They handed me this newborn baby, her daughter, and I said to myself, what do I do with this? <laughs> you know? And so I walk out of the hospital into the sunshine to the little bitty house that we were staying in, and Delene gets off the table and walks out of the hospital. So, you know, people have it so nice today. <laughs> but we continued in ministry and in uh, youth work and then village evangelism, and it was not until seven years later that we were able to open the doors of our pastoral training center. So that was a goal, a call that never left my sights. And we kept forging forward and forward. And when there would be a roadblock, I never stopped. I would either go around it or over it because I was so convinced that this was God's call. And I was not going to let anything prevent that from happening. So are there any North Americans leading that college now? No. In fact, from day one, my colleague and I, our goal was to work ourselves out of that job. And so the guys that we trained later would become the directors. And it is being directed and operated by Ivorians today. So we were successful in that, in that way. Um, you know, not very many people, when they are trained for a career, they don't start out to try to work themselves out of that job. You know, so what is it with missionaries or whatever? But, you know, that's the joy. And the thing that I love so much about Mike and Deline's ministry over the years was their intent with the idea that, you know what, our responsibility is to go and to make the disciples. And once we've done that, they don't need North Americans to stay there to oversee their work. They are, they are just as capable once they have the education and the knowledge of Scripture and they have grown up in the faith that they can do it. And they are doing it now. One of the aspects of 1040i is also church planting. How many churches have been planted by Avorians? Not North Americans now coming over. These are Avorians. Most of them have been through the college there, all right? And, or through studies with those who've been through the college. How many churches have been planted? Over the last four years, we started a church planting movement because it's so critical to my heart that the people amongst whom we have worked with all of these years close to 40 years, are still considered an unreached people group, the Lobi people. And so we started a church planting movement, and over the last four years, just over 70 churches have been planted by these guys. And this year, in January, I asked them, I said, I want you to write down what your goals and strategy is for 2018. Well, they'd never done that, so it was a, an exercise for them. It took them a couple of months, and then finally I got the report, and all 15 of them said, our goal is to plant between two and four churches, new churches, in 2018. The first six months of 2018, over 400 people Amongst the church planning movement, have come to Christ. So, Amen. God Amen. is at work through these guys. And, you know, it's their passion. I have not told them one thing what to do or what they should do or how they should do it. But they're passionate about reaching their own people. And just one last little tidbit story. Many, many years ago, when, I mean, I was so young and I went to this village to plant a church not far from about 15 miles from where we lived. And the very first time I went, it was for a funeral. And I am telling you, I was so scared because the lobbies, they just really animate funerals. 
And I, I just thought, you know, we were walking in amongst enemy territory as well. The guy was a believer, but the pagans had taken over. We, God gave me the courage, and we continued, and we planted a church there. And from this church has come out eight pastors. Amen. 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 Yeah, I probably don't need to make this connection for you. You all have probably made this connection on your own. But just in case you didn't, I want you to understand, it's taking the love of Christ, introducing Jesus to them, and adding to that mixture of faith, education. You see, no one could even read in the villages that they were going to when they arrived. That's how bad the education was. And so now when you take faith in Christ and education, you end up with church planters like this, all right, that he's talking about that are from their area. So I want you to understand this combination of faith and education. And that brings us to this year's drive, all right, to what we're going to talk about this year. Uh, what's the main project uh, that you're wanting to get accomplished in Ivory Coast now? You know, our, our call has been to education and Christian education. And a few years ago, God allowed us through a partner in Oklahoma to build an elementary school called the Tonda Bilingual Academy. They helped get us started. We're completing the first six grades this year, so we're adding the sixth grade. So it's complete. Next year, we need to have the middle school ready for the new kids coming on. It's the only Christian school in the northeast corner of the Ivory Coast. My goal is to transform this country through Christian education, raising up new generations of children that will be trained and become the leaders for tomorrow. This is the only way that we will change the trajectory of this country that among most of the countries on the continent of Africa are so corrupt. And that's why the people continue to live in poverty because they suppress them and they really don't want, the leaders really don't want them to learn, to be able to think for themselves. Well, we're about to change that. And I believe it can be or else I wouldn't be doing it. I'm very well aware of the fact that it might not happen in my lifetime, but we will set it in motion. And so this is the project that we bring to New Hope is the middle school helping us complete this, this facility. And education is what we've been a part of in Neonan, outside of Duropo, for the last four years. Um, one quick story, and we'll get back to Tonda. Uh, this past year, the government sent one of their officials up to the area to check out the Neonan school. Because Madame Elise has done the country, something that's not done. The average success rate at the end of sixth grade of students who take the test and qualify to go on to high school is 10%. And Madame Elise is 99%. Her students do really, really well. And you've made that possible with the dormitories and the library, which is there. And, and so this high-ranking official who came to check it out, Mike took him there showed it to him, then he brought him back to Duropo, brought him to where I was and, and introduced him and as the pastor of New Hope. And as you know, they've renamed part of the village at Neona, New Hope Village. And so introduced him and said, this is the pastor of the church who's made the difference. And this man had tears in his eyes and uh, he spoke English. And uh, he said, uh, I want to thank you and also... I've been shamed. And I thought, uh-oh, this isn't going to go well. And he said, that's my home village. I got away. And I got an education. And I've never been back till today. I promise you, I will be back. Thank you for what you've done for my family and my home village. 
that makes a difference, guys, when high officials in the government now are taking notice. And that paves the way. Uh, Neonan is a village of probably less than 100 people. Uh, the orphans that have come in to live with Madame Elise and get an education may outnumber the rest of the village that are there. Duropo, where the medical facility is and, and, and the surgeries are done, uh, that's a much larger, small town village of about, I think you told me, 10,000? 10, 10, uh, 20,000. About 20,000. Uh, though you've never seen anything in the U.S. that looks like that at 20,000. All right. And then Tonda, where this school is being built, is a community of about 50,000. They have some paved streets. They have some districts that look a bit more current. And when I say current, I'm going to say late 1800s, maybe in America, would be the equivalent of late 1800s kind of community. But the mayor there, educated in the States, met Mike before he went back and ran for mayor, and he, he had to run against a corrupt person who was taking all the money that the government would send down, building his own facilities and ignoring the village. And now they have a, a mayor who I'm not sure if he's a man of faith, but he's certainly closer than anybody else there that we know of, and uh, runs an honest government. And so uh, the project is $750,000 total. You've already raised a couple of hundred thousand. Well, towards that? About 155. 155. That's pretty exact. That's good. Um, so here is the challenge that I'm laying out to you today for this project. Uh, oh, one more thing. Ooh, boy, the time got away faster in here. Um, the director of the Tonda School is who? He is the cousin of our in-country president of Cote d'Ivoire, and he came to know the Lord a few years ago through the intervention of Pastor Tim. He speaks English fluently. He was also educated in the U.S. And so today he's leading the elementary school. And he overstates it a little bit here. Um, he is the cousin to Pastor Paul, who was one of the first students at their college that they started in the Ivory Coast. And he now is the director of 1040i in country, it's his cousin. Pastor Paul came to me four years ago or so and asked if I would visit with his cousin, uh, that he's done his best, but he's had no success leading him to Jesus. And uh, I said, well, I, I don't speak French. He said, he speaks English. He's been educated in the States. So that evening, we sat under a tree for about an hour and a half, talking, asking each other questions. At the end of the evening, I just looked at him and said, is there any reason you can't invite Christ in your life today? And he shrugged his shoulders and said, I can't think of one. And he invited Jesus Christ in his heart. I gave him a study Bible that year that you all helped provide for me to be able to give away. And over the years, I've given him other books. And he is now, and, and of course, Pastor Paul, the Bible says, some plant seeds, some water the seed. It is God who brings the harvest. Pastor Paul had planted. Pastor Paul had watered. I just happened to be fortunate to be there at that moment. But now he is the director of this school in Tonda. I just find all of those things so fascinating. So here's the way in which you can help. I need some, I need some men to volunteer to pass these out to every row. All right. So if I can get four guys here or so to just pass these out. All right. Everybody take one. Uh, there's a variety of ways in which you can be engaged in this project. First off, I need to tell you the board is up. Our sponsorship for our kids in the Onan is ready to be renewed. Uh, if you see a name under a child's name, you can't have that child. <laughs> Somebody has already adopted them for this year. Most of those whose names are already up there, these are the same children they've adopted the last few years. It's $585 for a year of sponsorship for our kids at Neonan. These are kids who are already in high school, and we've committed to seeing that they have the resources to finish high school. $585 a year for those students. It covers their education, new clothes, bike repair so they can get to and from seven miles twice a day, uh, their books and, and things they need for education, their food uh, in the village where Madame Elise is. They live in the dormitories that we have built. And uh, would you like to be able to take care of your children for $585 a year? 
So you can stop by, put your name up there, and follow up. Shelly will follow up with you after that, all right? Um, what being passed out now, this is another way you can support. Um, you can give $50, you can give $500, you can give $5,000. The project this year is Tonda. Uh, I think they've got that up there. But uh, let me tell you what I've sort of committed us to trying to accomplish. They're going to be building for this facility a library and a science lab that will be adjacent to each other. The cost of the library to build it and to supply it is $75,000. To do a science lab is the equivalent of two rooms. You can fund a room for $18,500. The science lab is two rooms. So if you take eighteen five. Multiply it by two, you get $37,000. You put those two together, you got $112,000. We've never raised that much money for 1040i in one year. You all have given over the last five years in excess of $150,000 for our projects in Neonan. You have been wonderful. We might not get this project done this year. This may be a two-year project for us. But I would like to see us get this library and science lab for the middle school, high school uh, built for them. Here's the ways in which we can do that. Number one, there might be one of you who would just simply like to write a check for $75,000. <laughs> or maybe you're saying, maybe not this year, but you'll write a check for $37,000. Fully fund one or the other project here. Your name will be put on a bronze plaque and it will be embedded in the wall of that science lab or that library. It'll be there as a testimony to your faith and what God is doing in the Ivory Coast for longer than you or I live. So that's one way to do it. You may say, Tim, there's not very many of us that can write a check like that. I can't, but there are some who can. And I'm not saying you should, but I am saying you should think about it. And... Um, the vast majority of us, we're going to be able to give 500 or 1,000 or 2,500. And some of you are saying, Tim, aren't we about ready to launch a building campaign here for a new building? And the answer to that question is yes. One month from now, we will be doing that. And some of you are saying, Tim, are you nuts to ask for this kind of money when you're going to be asking for that? No, I'm not nuts. I'm rooted in God's Word. I think it would be a huge mistake for us to be selfish and focus our attention on ourselves first and others second. I believe God honors both our personal commitment to Him in our tithes and our offerings, and I think He honors a church for the very same thing. If we take care of the Great Commission, God will take care of our mission. And so I want you to seriously think about what am I going to do in this project? Take this form, put your name on it. If you are writing a check today, make it to New Hope, all right? New Hope will send one check to 1040i. If you're going to do a monthly pledge or a yearly pledge, uh, you can still make that to New Hope. It will be sent immediately, all right, to 1040i. If you're going to do this by credit card, you can put all the information on here indicate how it's going to be, whether it's a one-time gift, whether it's going to be a monthly, quarterly, or yearly gift. Put all that information on here in just a moment. Ushers are going to come by. We're going to have a brief offering today. Some of you are saying, Tim, you can't expect us to write a check like that at the spur of the moment. You're right. I don't. So you can come back tonight at 5 o'clock and bring it with you and put it in the offering bag tonight. And if that is not quite enough time, then you can bring it back next Sunday after you've had a week to pray about it, contemplate it, think about it. Bring this back and you can put it in the offering next week. And here's the deal. Whatever your commitment is for this year, would like it in by December 1st. You don't have to bring it tonight or next Sunday, but you can say, hey, Tim, I'm going to give $2,500. Great. We'd love it in by December 1st because they've got to buy the materials to continue this building project going up. And if we don't finish it this year, we will strive to get it fully funded by next year. But I, 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 wouldn't it just be so cool to be able to praise God and say, look what you did. And then a month from now, you guys fully pay off the new building that we're getting ready to build. That would just be absolutely a testimony 
to the grace of God and the sacrifices that we are willing to make. We don't need as many Starbucks as we think we do. I don't need to buy a new car. I have an electric, what's it even called? A Fiat. I was about to call it a Chevy Sprint. That was another lifetime. I had that one. Simply so we can give to what God is doing in the other part of the world. I hope to see. Ushers, would you come wait on us? Because we're just now about 10 minutes late. So, uh, if you've already made up your mind, you know what you're going to do, or you're saying, Tim, I, all I can do is I can put this 20 in. Great. Put the 20 in. Put the 100 in. Whatever it is. Uh, we're going to do that right now. If you filled this out, great. Put it in. I had some people in the 8 o'clock service didn't get it all finished before we took the offering. They handed it to me later. You can do that. We'll make sure it gets put in the next service, uh, or you can bring these back tonight or next week. If you, have, if you have blanks, one of these that you didn't fill it out, and you're, you, you don't need any time, but you just don't need it, would you leave it on the pew? Because we're going to need them for the next service. Okay? Thank you very much. Let's, guys, go ahead. Start waiting on us. Uh, Milo, how about, uh, come up here real quick. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. All right? I think we can do that one. If you want to go uh, next year, about $3,500 is what the cost is going to be. Come back more tonight and find out about it, whether you're in the medical field, whether you were in construction, and we're unsure yet about Kids Fest, but there will be something that you can do. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see you know what? If 75 was a little too much in one check and 30, 37 uh, was a little too much, you could just do 18.5 and that will be a classroom and your name will be on it. Here's the last part of this. If nobody does it for the total amount and gets your personal name on it, then but we're able to do one or the other collectively, then the name of New Hope Church, all right, will be there in there and you will have been part of that. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hope to see you back at 5 o'clock today. All right? Have a good afternoon.